I have a couple of announcements. There will be a meeting of the sexual dysfunction group at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Is somebody going to make announcements before I... Announcements, Dick. Wait a minute. All right. <laughs> I'm one, I, I guess you're wondering why I called this meeting. No. Well, I'm just gonna have. All right, let's see. So the winner of the Joker is Lucky Leslie Barrett. Bazit. I can't read the handwriting. <laughs> Leslie? <laughs> Number 12, Rebecca Yancey. You have just won this wonderful book by Dave Bash. Other people will now announce things to you. I hope. Hi. I promise I won't try to act tonight. <laughs> a couple of very quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow morning, things start off a little later, so if you choose to, you may sleep in, and breakfast lasts from 8 until 10 tomorrow, so you have a little later time. However, I recommend that you meet either Adam here at 8.30 to go on a hike, it's moved from 9 to 8.30, so change that in your calendars. Or meet me at the Fowler Center for yoga. I threatened to do a pose up here, and the staff recommended that I not. So <laughs> you can see it in the morning. Um, 8.30 for the hike here, 9 o'clock at Fowler, which is the gym for yoga. 11 o'clock here for the fabulous Gail Hockman. Um, I just added a couple things to the Lost and Found, which has now been created and is on the shelf back there, a sippy cup and an earring, so if you're missing those things, they're there. And finally, there is a dance tonight. I know everybody is excited. I hope you all have your dates. It is in the pub, which is right there. It's easier to point and follow than to try to give you any sort of directions, but look for the only neon lights in Swanee. And DJ JJ will be there. He's already there warming up for you. So we'll see you there. And now Dick Bash. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, of course, and um, I want to thank the staff and Wyatt and everybody for having me. I have to say that uh, this is the most uh, um, wonderful visit I've had to Sewanee because so many members of my family are here along with my dear friends. My daughter Maggie is right there with Amanda. Stand up, guys. Take a bow. <laughs> Maggie's friend Peter. Friend? <laughs> Maggie's beau, Peter. My son in law, Adam. And, and my darling wife, Lisa, who dressed me. Uh, And, and my, uh, are there, I have many dear, dear friends here, um, and I love you all. Um, I also want to ask for a hand for these marvelous photographs of Miriam's that are on the wall back here. Uh, she, she never ceases to amaze me at, at figuring out just when the moment is to take the picture, but these are marvelous pictures and she's been taking them the whole week. Um, so I wanted to do that. And uh, you can buy these. Uh, I don't know what the price is, but... Affordable. <laughs> Now, before I read, because I just always do, I have to tell you a story. I told it 
to my friend Richard Tillinghast tonight, and I realize it really is a good story. It's about a very mean practical joke I played on my dear friend George Garrett, who told me one day with a sigh, a kind of an exhausted sigh, that it was his duty, he taught at the University of Virginia, a week from Saturday, he said, I have to go to Dulles. I have to drive up to Dulles Airport. And I didn't live far from Dulles. He said, where well, I have to pick up five writers from New Delhi who are coming in to visit the university. And I said, well, I live near it. And he said, no, nah, I wouldn't ask you to do that. Don't worry about it. But I just couldn't help it. Uh, the next Saturday, so it was the Saturday before the Saturday he thought it was, which it was. <laughs> but I called the next Saturday, and he answered and said, hello. And I said, Mr. Garrett, we are wondering where you are. We are here at Dallas. And we have been here for about 20 minutes. We wonder, if uh, are you coming? And uh, he goes, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I got the day wrong. Uh, my friend Richard Bouse doesn't live far away. Let me call him right now. <laughs> and I said, all right, take your time. It's all right. And, and, and he hung up, uh, and I hung up, and I waited, and the phone rang. I picked it up. I said, hello. And he says, man, you got to help me. I said, what? And he said, you got to go to the airport now. They, they came in now. I said, who? He says, no, those five guys from New Delhi. And I went, oh, all right. I'll leave right now. Uh, I'll go right now. And he says, okay. He said, how long do you think it'll take you to get there? I said, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes. He said, oh, hurry. I said, I will, I promise. So I waited 25 minutes and then called him and said, I got pulled over. Uh, and it's it, it's going to be a little bit longer. If he calls you, just tell him I got pulled over. So I waited in five minutes and I called. <laughs> And he goes, hello. And I said, Mr. Garrett, we wonder where this Richard Bars is. You said. And he says, oh, that dumb son of a bitch got pulled over. <laughs> I, I don't know where he is. I'm really sorry. But he'll get there. I promise. He's really dependable. <laughs> and, and I said, well, could you call him back and tell him to hurry? I'm going to do it. I promise. <laughs> so he called me back. And I picked up the phone. And I said, hello, do you want to talk to me? And he says, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I did something to Ford, I gotta tell you that too. I called him. He had an interview with a guy from Alabama and our, our mutual friend Gil Dennis said, uh, you think you can do a, you know, a guy from Alabama? Uh, I said, I can take a stab at that, sure. So I called and Richard answered the phone. I said, Mr. Ford, this is Gareth Swain of the Oregonian. He's never seen the guy, never heard his voice. I said, I wonder if maybe we couldn't, I know we have this lunch tomorrow and I just wonder if we could save some time by just, you know, setting the ground week. And he goes, all right. And I said, so these novels you write, are they fiction or nonfiction? <laughs> he actually hit falsetto when he answered. He, he said, no, I mean, they're non, I mean, they're fiction. <laughs> and I said, you mean as in a story? He goes, yes. <laughs> and I said, well, if a story is a story and a novel is a novel, what makes a story a story and a novel a novel? He goes, that's the, I love the sigh. Went, a novel, and I could hear him thinking, I gotta spend a lunch with this idiot tomorrow. You know? <laughs> I said, uh, if a novel is a novel, he goes, a novel is long and a story is short. <laughs> and I said, well then what about a novella? He goes, a novella's between the novel and the story. And I said, well, then what about a novelette? He goes, the novelette is the same thing as a novella. And I said, well, well then what about a novellini? <laughs> and he said, Bouse, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. <laughs> now what I have to read you is... I'm going to read two pieces, one very, very short and the other one slightly longer. And the laughs are over, folks. <laughs> this is called self-knowledge. Have I forgotten anybody, honey? <laughs> that morning, Alan Meltzer had an asthma attack and was taken to the hospital. It disrupted the class, and Mrs. Porter, the teacher, edged toward panic. 
Her husband was in Seattle trying to save things. A once big man in the airline industry was Jack. Gone a lot these days, even when home. Money troubles, drinking through the evenings to calm down. She too. They drank separately, and he'd been violent on occasion. They were going to pieces. A comforting word, cordials. She'd drink cordials in the nights, bouncing around alone in the house. She felt no bitterness, considered herself a fighter. They were in serious debt, living on cash only, bills piling up. This month's cash was gone. The house was empty of cordiality. She had no appetite to speak of and nothing to drink. A terrible morning. But she got herself up and out to work. And Alan had the asthma attack. Pure terror. No one had ever expressed how physical thirst could get, how deep it went down into the soul. Some days Alan Meltzer's parents had prevailed on her to give the boy a ride home. They lived a hundred yards from her on the other side of Jefferson Street. Alan was a quiet, shy boy. She had heard his loud father outside calling him stupid. She would think about his big, moist, dark eyes in class. She'd tried being especially kind. This child with asthma, allergies, a fear of others. The other children were murderously perceptive and pecked at him. All this lent urgency and guilt to the fact that he was gone to the hospital with asthma. Urgency because she feared for him, guilt because she planned to use his absence. No sense lying to herself. She had such an awful dread. When the school day ended, she started for the hospital planning to check on Alan. The Meltzers would be there. They saw her as a kindly, childless woman, Mrs. Porter, who had nurtured a whole generation of school children. Well, it was true, and they trusted her. She had a key to their house for those times she took the boy home. No, she wouldn't deceive herself. A drink was necessary before she faced the Meltzers, before she let another hour go by. She drove to their house and let herself in. Mr. Meltzer kept only whiskey. She ransacked their kitchen looking for it, resolved to fix everything when she got to a level. When she could think straight again out of this shaking, quite simple, she was contending with something that had come up on her and surprised her. She drank most of the bottle, slowly and painfully at first, but then with more ease, gulping it, getting calm. She wasn't a bad woman. They loved, she loved those kids, loved everyone. She'd always carried herself with dignity and never complained. A smile and a kind word for everybody, Mrs. Porter. Once she and Jack had made love on the roof of a Holiday Inn while fireworks went off in another part of the city they were passing through. On their 15th anniversary, they pretended to be strangers in a hotel bar and raced to their room on the sixth floor, laughing, filled with an illicit feeling hunger for each other. Now she did what she could with the kitchen reeling. Her own crashing down fall startled her as if it were someone else. Jack, she said. Oh yes, Jack. Her once friend and lover, a world away. But all would be well. She could believe it now. She went out into the yard, looked at the trees, the late afternoon sun pouring through with breezes, life's light and breath, the great wide world. She felt good. She felt quite reasonable. Nothing out of order. Life would provide. She started across the span of grass leading to the trees, confused about where home was. She sat down in the grass, then lay back. When they returned, the Meltzers would see. She would have to explain to them, show them the necessity. Honesty is what we owe each other. She'd always told the children that, hadn't she? She had lived by it, hadn't she? Be true, my darlings, she had said. Always, always tell the truth, even to yourself. That was what she'd said. She was Mrs. Porter. That was what she was known for. That's called self-knowledge. And now this one, which is slightly longer. 
I'm sorry. You're, you're all looking at me like, shit, I was having a, I was having a good time. It all went to hell, God. This is called The Wait. This is a story I would have told grandchildren and great-grandchildren if I'd had any. I had three wives, but no children. That's a mystery, I suppose, as it's a mystery that I've been around for more than a century and am still blessed with reasonably fair health. I also remember what I had for breakfast this morning and who I talked with. You might have to remind me who you are if you come back, but that was always true. They say the far past becomes clearer as you get older and the near past gets dim. Well, I remember some things clearer than others and there doesn't seem to be a pattern I can figure. More than 90 years ago when I was almost 12 years old, something happened that I knew nothing would ever erase from my memory. When I tell you about it, you won't ever forget it either. In the summer of 1903, that's right, just after the turn of the last century, we lived in a little three-bedroom house on the outskirts of Baltimore, my mother and father, my older sister Livy, and me. In mid-June, father came down with a bad fever. He was delirious for three days, and for a while everybody thought he was going to die. He was a young man, only 34, but he got very dehydrated, and his fever kept getting higher. Then mother came down with it as well, and Livy and I were shuffled off to our neighbor's house. That was where we got sick. Nobody knew quite what to do with us. The neighbor, Mrs. Lessing, was afraid to move us or be near us either. For all anyone knew, our parents were dying. We were all dying. She got so frightened that she went over to the post office and sent a telegram to her cousin out in Frederick, and he came in with his wagon and mules and took her away. She left her maid, Anna Scott, to nurse us. Anna was a black woman of about 30. I was nearly blind with fever and she seemed too large for the room. Not heavy, but big boned and tall with thick features and long fingered smooth hands. At least the backs of them were smooth. The palms made a pleasant scratching when they moved across your face or rested on your forehead. When the fever would let up a little during the day, she told us about the heavy mists in London and how she had seen the terrible tower where people were kept for years, some waiting to have their heads cut off. She knew all the names of the kings and queens of England, Plantagenets and Stuarts and Tudors. And in the brief respite from sickness, there was something wonderful about imagining palace intrigue in a faraway place. Livy wanted more about the executions. Anna would demur for a time, denying that she knew anything so gruesome. Then she would go on and say, there is nothing more gruesome than the truth. And she would tell us in that soft drawl about Henry VIII's unfortunate wives or Mary, Queen of Scots. I liked her, I liked listening to her soft contralto voice. She described for us the frightful conditions on the ship she came to America on as a little girl, the deaths at sea and how they slipped the bodies over the side off a long wooden board. Her ancestors were free blacks who lived in Wales. She had stories about her father who had trained in medicine down in Alabama where she grew up and had taught her some of what he knew. When she spoke of the mistress of the house, her eyes said more than her words. She had a low opinion of old Mrs. Lessing, who was as silly as she was cowardly. Y'all understand, she'd say quietly, this world is um, upside down. Before it was over, she got sick too. Her cold colored skin gleamed with sweat. And when she sat down on the bed to put a cool rag on my head, it was as if she had collapsed there. Lord, she said, I feel low down. But she's never stopped tending to us. She told us of growing up in Alabama and coming north on the train and meeting, Thad meeting Thaddeus Marcus Adams of Pratt Street in the city of Baltimore. She liked to use the phrase, listen to it, darlings, she said, running a cold rag over Livy's cheeks. Thaddeus Marcus Adams of Pratt Street in the city of Baltimore. Sometimes she sang it, lifting my shirt from my back and washing me, her hands burning with fever. At night we waited for her, and the sound of her in the house kept me awake. She moved through my dreams, and Thaddeus Marcus Adams got mixed up in it too. I dreamed he spoke to me and washed my forehead. I had a memory which I am now fairly certain was not the product of delirium, of wandering out of the room and seeing a tall, powerful-looking brown man in the upper hallway of the house. 
He wore a white long sleeve shirt with the sleeves rolled above the elbow and I saw the thick veins standing out on his arms. I tried to ask Anna if this was Thaddeus. She was singing low, still feverish, spooning broth into my mouth. Hush, she said, hush child, you've been dreaming. Is it Thaddeus, I said, tell me. Thaddeus is away, she said. You mustn't speak of him in this house. You, you must have dreamed it, child. But then she put her head down and rocked slow as if she might slump over. My head. Here, I said, and I took the rag from her hand and put it on her forehead. She raised her head slightly and breathed. It was only a moment. She straightened and took my wrist. I'm just tired, child. Anna, I tried to say. I only wanted to say her name. But I couldn't get it out. I nodded and felt that there must be something between us, a secret. When Livy and I had first come to the house, we didn't even know her. She was just the next door lady's person, kitchen help. I don't think we had even known her name until that week. Mother was next door, dangerously close to dying. Father's fever had broken, but he was still very weak, and other neighbors were with them. For that strange week, we were a sundered family being cared for in separate houses. I seldom thought of my family. I spent dream hours awake and asleep with Anna Scott. The worst night of my fever, I thought I looked out the window of the bedroom where I lay and saw my father in his coffin in a flickering yellow light in the next house, hands crossed over his chest. No one standing near. I felt as though I had abandoned him to that fate. I lay crying and muttering that I was sorry. I'm sure now that I dreamed this, since I know the room that I was in faced away from our house, and the view of that window was, off the, uh, was of the fairgrounds where the circus came every summer. After the fever passed, Mrs. Lessing returned from the country, and a day or so later we went back over to our house. At almost 12 and 14, we were not quite old enough yet to understand the particulars of the social setup in 1903. Obviously, it was the air we lived in, but we had no conscious sense of that. We saw Mrs. Lessing ordering Anna Scott around, making her clean the surfaces of the bedroom with strong lye soap, and the old lady shooed Livy and me away whenever we came near. We represented disease to her. That was what Father said when we went home. He was going to work again in the mornings. He had recently been made head teller at the Union Trust Bank in town. Mother was still recovering, and the heat and humidity were no help. She lay on her bed in her long nightgown, gleaming not so much with fever, though a mild one did persist through the hot days, but with the windless summer heat. Women from other houses stopped by now and then to look in on her and to bring her iced tea and books to read. People expected Livy and me to keep out of the way, not to trouble Mother. We sought chances to talk to Anna Scott. She would be out and back, hanging wash. What do you children want with me, she'd say, half smiling. You're going to get me into trouble, sure enough. In France, Livy said, they have a thing called a guillotine. Anna corrected her. You pronounce it guillotine. It's a terrible thing. It cuts off people's heads, Livy said avidly. And sometimes the eyes still look around after the heads rolling around on the ground. Who told you that? I heard it, Livy said, I swear. The head falls into a basket, Anna said. I felt lightheaded. I turned to Livy. Is that all you can talk about? Tell us how it works, Livy said to Anna Scott. I don't have any idea how it works, child. Why did they only use it in France, Anna? I've never been to France. Would you like to go, I asked, and felt as if I'd propose that we go together. <laughs> she gave me a long look that seemed to reach down into my chest. I couldn't breathe. Why, John, are you toying with my affections? <laughs> I didn't know how to answer the question. But then she was concentrating on her work. Don't you children have anything better to do than pester me? You know Miss Lessing is going to give me, give me grief if she sees us. We don't have anywhere else to go, Libby said. This was true. The only other child our age who lived at that end of Market Street was Dewey Dumfries, and she could not be depended on for entertainment. Dewey was an albino, but we didn't know this. I mean, no one had said anything to us about it. We just knew she couldn't be out in the sun very much, that her skin was pale as paste, her hair a startling white, whiter than we could believe anyone's ever was, even when we were looking at it. And her eyes were a strange-looking pink, the color of a rabbit's nose. She spent a lot of time writing in a journal. She seemed never to want to do anything else. She seldom left her front porch. But when she wanted company, she would call to us. When we came out of the house, 
It depended on her mood, of course, and she was rather inclined to fits of unsociability. This particular afternoon, I'm remembering we were fresh from fever, Livy and me, and that's how it seems to me anyway, recalling it. A hot, humid, cloudless day with a stillness about it as if the earth had stopped spinning on its axis and was fixed in a searing pool of sun. See, things seem bright with an unnatural brightness, a feverish glare, perhaps because we had been ill and were now better. Mother had told us to go outside and to stay in the yard. We were on the porch. Anna Scott was beating dust out of a rug in Mrs. Lessing's side yard. The day was on fire, too hot for work. I held on to the porch post, lines of heat rose in the air. Anna Scott turned and looked at us, her face gleaming, her eyes wide and white. In the window of the Lessing house, Mrs. Lessing stood watching her like a hawk. When Anna glanced our way, Mrs. Lessing said something we couldn't hear, and Anna said something back that ended in ma'am. She waved at us, going back in the house. I'm tired, Livy said to me. We knew that some people had died of this fever we had survived. Livy stared at her own hands. I think we were both experiencing the sense of how different it was to be on the other side of the sickness. Mother coughed upstairs, and I had a guilty moment of wanting to get away from the sound. The stillness carried every stirring, every breath. We went out to the end of the yard and looked up and down the street. In the distance beyond the railroad yard, you could see the big partially collapsed red, white, and blue tent from the circus that had always come to town from mid-May to mid-July, and, and that a lot of people were unjustly blaming for this epidemic of fever. That was why it was closing down early. Dewey Dumfrey, Dumfrey strolled over to us from her porch wearing a floppy straw hat, a long sleeve blouse, and a skirt that covered her feet. You couldn't see her feet. She appeared to glide like a ghost across the grass. Know what happened, she said. Then didn't wait for an answer. My Uncle Harry came in from work about an hour ago and told us there's been a terrible accident, accident down at the rail yard. An elephant fell off the back of the train. They were coming to catch up with the circus all the way from Scranton, and this one named Sport got playful, and he backed against the door of the car, and the door broke, and he went off. He went flying off and landed on the track off of a moving train car. An elephant, think of it. Uncle Harry said he screamed, a terrible scream. They were bringing them, two of them, to the circus. The circus is breaking up, I said. Nobody went to it because of the fever. Well, they were getting two elephants, and now one of them's dead, and they're going to have to kill the other one to put it out of its misery. What happened to the other one, I said. Did it fall too? No, the other one that fell is still alive, but he can't move his legs or stand up. The other one just up and died, maybe from the shock. Maybe they love each other like people. Maybe the shock of her friend falling off the train killed her. You're making all this up, Libby said. I am not. I swear on a stack of Bibles and hope to die myself. Livy saw Anna Scott come from the Lessing house wearing a white scarf like a bandana. We ran over to her and Dewey repeated her story, adding the one detail that the people at the rail yard had used a big freight derrick to hoist sport back up onto the train car. They think his back might be broken. My Uncle Harry was there and saw the whole thing. Anna looked up the road in the direction of the rail yard. And then she looked back at us. My friend Thaddeus works there, she said, in that voice I loved. He'll know what happened. It's a God's truth, Dewey said. Oh, I ain't doubting you, honey. We all stood there looking down the street. You could see some of the apparatus of the rail yard, and there were tracks that led there across the road beyond the houses. You walked between the houses and through a row of hedges across a narrow field of tall grass. There was a raised bed that was visible in the winter months, and when a train came through, you could see it going by in flashes between hedges and houses and trees. We never paid much attention to the trains because they had been there all our lives. Their sound roaring along in the wake of smoke and the blaring of a whistle was, an unremarkable, was as unremarkable to us as the clop-clop of horses' hooves in the street, the protesting of wagon wheels. I want to go see, Libby said. Anna shook her head. Honey, you know your mother wouldn't want that. She'll let us if you take us, Livy said. To the rail yard? Me? Young lady, you sure, st sure you still don't have fever? She put her dark hand on Livy's brow, which was almost as pale as Dewey's. Can we ask her, I said. I was speaking with the confidence of the one who was close enough to, to her to know about Thaddeus Marcus Adams. Anna frowned. I think you best let her sleep, don't you, John? My name on those lips thrilled me. I felt the blood rush to my face. Yes, I said, being responsible. 
Well, I'll tell you what, Anna said. I'll go on down there this afternoon and see what I can, and I'll come back and tell you all about it. How'd that be? Livy wasn't impressed. It's not the same as seeing it. <laughs> There's probably something, nothing to see, honey. It's over, whatever it was. From the Lessing house just then came the voice of Mrs. Lessing. You, Anna, what are you doing talking to those children? I asked you to go get some tonic for me. Yes, sir, Anna called back. I don't have all day to wait for you. No, ma'am, I know. I was going just as quick as I can, Ms. Lessing. By this time, Livy and I were accustomed to the difference in Anna's speech when she spoke to Mrs. Lessing. I considered it part of our special relation to each other. Anna murmured to us, I'll see if I can't find out something. You all stay here and do. You better not stay out in this here sun too long. Yes, ma'am. We watched her cross the street and go up the block away from the direction of the rail yard and toward the old part of town where the dry goods store and the pharmacy were. She waved to us just before she went out of sight. My mother says, Anna's a faithless heathen, Dewey said. I think she's nice. I wish Mrs. Lessing would go back to Frederick, said Livy. We wandered over to Dewey's house and onto the porch where we sat in metal chairs. Nothing moved. There wasn't a breeze anywhere in the world. The leaves hung on the trees, wilting. The hottest day in the history of summer. Dewey's Uncle Harry was on the back porch of the house talking to her mother. We couldn't make out the words through the open window, and we wanted to, so we said nothing, trying to hear. But they were two rooms and a corridor away. Finally, we went down and around the house to where they sat with a pitcher of lemonade on the little table between their chairs. Hey, kids, Dewey's Uncle Harry said, hot enough for you? He took a sip of the lemonade and made a face. You kids stay close, Dewey's mother said. There's trouble, serious trouble. We know all about it, Dewey said. Uncle Harry sat forward. What do you know, little girl? About the elephant. Oh, he said, that. He sat back. We waited for him to say more, but he sipped the lemonade and stared off. Dewey started talking about the circus. She had been twice, she said. Her Uncle Harry had taken her. She went on about what she'd seen there. I heard her mother say to Uncle Harry, I think he's got himself a lady friend in the next house. And I stopped listening to Dewey. You're kidding me, Uncle Harry said. If I'm not mistaken, I've seen him at the back door over there hanging around her. You know what, the, what kind of friend I mean? Of course, they're all so highly, I have no inhibitions where, well, I mean, I think it's frightening. Dewey's uncle said nothing for a moment. Then, does Mrs. Lessing know? She'd fire her in an instant. Well, it's a small world. What do you think they'll do with him, Mrs. Dumfries asked, and I understood, finally and surely, that they must be talking about Thaddeus Marcus Adams of Pratt Street in the city of Baltimore. I said, what did he do? Uncle Harry looked at me. Uncle Harry, do he said, tell us about the elephant. He shook his head. I'm trying not to think about the elephant. Please? He turned to Mrs. Dumfrey. I'm not kidding. You, the worst noise I ever heard, that scream. I never thought an animal could make such a sound. I mean, there was something intelligent about it. He sat there with a glass of lemonade held to his lips. Mrs. Dumfries poured more lemonade and said, can't you children find something to do out in front? What did he do, I repeated. Who, Uncle Harry said then, don't be impertinent, young man. I started to say the name Thaddeus, but thought better of it. I was afraid I might get Anna Scott in trouble. Do we take John and Livy around to the front porch, please, Mrs. Dumfries said. Can't we have some lemonade? Mrs. Dumfries considered a moment, all right, you can have some lemonade. Dewey went into the house and brought out three glasses and filled them from the pitcher. We sat on the back porch steps and drank the faintly stinging sweet lemonade. The glasses beaded up immediately and the lemonade looked better than it tasted. After a while, we saw Mrs. Lessing come out of her house and go along the alley on that side to the street behind us. Dewey was rattling on about the lemonade at the circus and I kept my attention on Uncle Harry and Mrs. Dumfries. You suppose Mrs. Lessing knows about it already, he said. She will soon enough. Would you keep a maid with a boyfriend that would threaten a white woman? Uncle Harry stopped. Mrs. Dumfries had caught me listening and held her hand up very softly. She said, John, you and the girls go play. We walked around to the front of the house. I felt restless and impatient to know more. Again, we were listening, trying to hear what the adults were saying, and I thought I heard the word impertinent again. I'm sick of this, Livy said. Let's do something. I'm going to the freight yard, said Dewey. She stepped down off the porch. 
We heard mother cough from the bedroom window above the side yard. The sound made us pause, but she was in bed half dreaming. The white lace curtains of the window were still as stone. Beyond the space of the window was the wall clock. It chimed once. We waited. It was as if we were waiting for the sound of the clock again, or for mother's cough, but there was only the murmur of the voices on the back porch. Come on, Dewey said, if you're coming. You're not supposed to be out in the sun, Libby said. What about Uncle Harry and your mother? I'm protected, said Dewey. I'm tired of sitting around. They'll sit out there for at least another hour. We followed her out to the sidewalk and on to the end of the street, then across to the other side. The rail yard was about a quarter of a mile away and we went slow as if to hurry would reveal our true purpose. On one porch, someone darker than Anna Scott sat rocking a baby, the baby crying and protesting. We'd heard the cries a long way away. The woman watched us for a few paces then gave over to worrying about what was in her lap. The train yard smelled suffocatingly of coal and creosote and smoke. There were cars ranged along one wide group of about a dozen pairs of rails. The whole yard, as I later yearn, learned, and we went past this on toward the yard office where two men stood smoking. They were about the same age, both blonde and with the grime of the yard on their faces smudged where they'd wiped the sweat off. The tall one wore a vest and a short sleeve white shirt. The other was shirtless in overalls. We came to see the herd elephant, Dewey said to them. Get on out of here, said the tall one. The three of you, if you know what's good for you, get. We didn't move. Wait a minute, Jesse, the other one said. He leaned toward us, blowing smoke. He stared at Dewey. What the hell if you ain't the whitest child I ever saw? Look at this, Jesse. Man, this is the opposite of a nigger. Jess, Jesse laughed. Cal, you crazy some bitch, you know it? Watch your language, Cal said. Then he spoke into Dewey's face. Ain't you the complete opposite of a nigger? Dewey's lower lip shook, but she said nothing, staring back into the dirty, sweat-beaded face. Up close, I saw that they were both older men. I want to see, we want to see the elephant that fell off the train, I said. The one named Jesse said, well, maybe you can and maybe you can't. He had brown teeth and he spit through them, then wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. He had stepped closer to Dewey, who had stiffened without giving any ground. I smelled tobacco and sweat. Jesse said, you know, I bet these street urchins, urchins would taste good on a bed of lettuce, Cal. <laughs> I bet they would, said Cal. He rubbed his stubbled face, then flicked the cigarette out into the cinders of the yard. He brought a pouch and papers out of his shirt pocket and began to roll another. Heck, Jesse said, maybe they ought to see our little party. Might do them good. You're a damn philosopher, Jesse. You watch your language. Come on, Dewey said to us. They don't know anything. We walked away from them. After a few paces, I turned, and they were standing there staring. Hey, Cal yelled, and he pointed. There were more tracks ahead. A small group of men had gathered near one of the empty railroad cars. They were moving with a quickness, as if struggling with something or trying to lift something. Cal whistled and gestured for us to go over there. Well, Dewey said to me, you go, Libby said. Dewey started, but then turned and came back. I'll go, I said. I kept to the edge of the rails. There were other cars beyond this one. I wondered which one held the elephant and what these men I was approaching must have already done with the one that had died. The grass that bordered the yard was burned in the sun, stained with coal dust. The group of men had become still, their backs to me. I got to within about 20 yards of the car when one of them turned and saw me, a big man in a seersucker suit and a straw hat. He walked a few paces in my direction. There's nothing for you here, he said. The backs parted and in the middle of the crowd I saw a brown man in what had been a white shirt. His face was battered and bleeding. You couldn't tell much about the features of the, for the swelling of the eyes and the blood on his jaw and neck. The blood was all over the white shirt which hung on his big chest in shreds. His hands were behind his back. He looked at me. They jostled him and closed in around him, moving around to the other side of the car. I saw their feet there, a lot of confused motion, straining. The man in the straw hat was coming toward me. Shoo! Go home where you belong! It was clear that he meant to evict me physically. If he had to, I backed away, then turned and ran. When I glanced over my shoulder, I saw that he was chasing me, big lumbering steps, his arms flailing at his sides. I yelled, and Livy, who was always faster than I, left us behind, running far ahead. I caught up to Dewey, and we crossed the rails, then angled back toward Market Street through a field of dry knife grass that stung our legs, and big blue stones, quarry stones, they looked like, that tripped us up. 
We climbed the roadbed and stumbled across the rails and down the other side and went on between the houses, Livy leading the way. We came out on Market Street and lay down on the grass of the first lawn fighting for breath. My heart pounded in my face behind my eyes for a long while. We couldn't move or speak. Finally, Livy said, what was it? What were they doing? We just wanted to see the dang thing, said Dewey. Tell us, Livy said. I said, I didn't see anything. I remember thinking that it was my business, not hers or Dewey's. We were quiet then. A wagon came up the street, two large drays pulling it, and a boy sitting up on the bench with a piece of Johnson grass in his mouth. The boy looked at us as the wagon came by, and then he lifted a skinny hand to wave. I waved back. I bet the elephant's already shipped somewhere else, Dewey said. We got to our feet and went along the street. When we reached Dewey's house, we walked through the airless hallway to the kitchen and out onto the back porch. There wasn't anyone there. We drank water from the well and back and poured it over our faces. Then we sat on the porch steps as if waiting for the day to change. My head spun a little, probably from the running, but it frightened me. I felt sick. I watched the windows of Mrs. Lessing's house and nothing stirred there. Dewey said, I wonder where they are. Probably looking for us, Livy said. Why did that man chase us? I don't know, I said. How do I know? We were abruptly irritable with one another. They were looking at me. I wondered if what I had seen might be visible in my face. It was hard to believe they couldn't see it. I felt it in my cheeks like a bruise. Presently, Anna Scott came into the alley from the end of the side street where Mrs. Lessing had gone earlier. She came slow, her hands knotted at her abdomen. I stepped down to the well with one of the lemonade glasses and filled it with water, then hurried across the lawn to meet her. She had seen me and paused, her lips parted slightly. She was crying. I saw that she was standing there crying, and I wanted so to touch her, to say something, anything. She ran the backs of her hands over her eyes. I had the sense that I had known all along she would be like this when I saw her again. Hey, I managed to say, want some water? She spoke through her teeth. Is that how you address a grown-up? Hey? No, I said. She sobbed. Anna, her lips curled back. You get away from me. She sobbed again. Then she spit the words at me, white boy. Her depthless eyes fixed me there and held me out. I could almost see them shut down under the black irises. She said nothing more but crossed to Mrs. Lessing's back door and went in. What was that, Livy said as I returned to Dewey's back porch. I sat down on the top step, silent, watching where Anna had gone. I guess Livy knew enough not to ask me again. I think I understood most of what had already happened and I wonder if it even needs me to repeat it here. Thaddeus Marcus Adams. <laughs> I know how you felt, Tim. <laughs> of Pratt Street in the city of Baltimore had said something that a white lady considered flippant. And for this had been beaten to within an inch of his life and strung up on the street lamp at the border of what everyone back then called Darktown. Some people from his neighborhood had cut him down and he was not dead, but he was blind. He would never walk without a limp. And of course, any kind of life he might have had was over forever. The lady who had been insulted had nearly run him down with her surrey as he came from lunch at a cafe on Market Street, walking toward the railroad yard to see about an elephant falling out of a livestock car. The most con unusual thing about that day took place in the evening at six o'clock. They hanged the elephant. Livy and I went with my father to see it. Dewey and her mother were there too. A lot of people from the town came out it was almost like a festival. They had got the elephant unconscious with ether, and they put a chain around his leathery neck and began lifting him on the same freight derrick they had earlier used to put him back up on the train car. He woke as the chain pulled him up, standing on his hind legs so that it looked like a trick. He screamed, even through the tightness of the chain. It had disappeared where it was wrapped around the neck, but the line of it jutted from the loose flesh on up to the top of the freight derrick, tight as a piano wire. The elephant's head was turned oddly to one side and his screaming thinned out so that it was only a kind of hissing and gasping. The body stretched long, the rear feet were still touching the ground. He was choking slow. They let the chain down again with a rush and the elephant was on his knees. I realized again that he couldn't stand or walk. 
A man that I recognized as Jesse tried to administer more ether, but it was no use. So again, they set the winch going, and the chain tightened and lifted, and they kept it going until the animal looked to be standing upright again. Front legs hanging down, back legs supporting no weight, but still touching the ground. An instant later, the elephant emptied his bowels and his bladder, and there was a gasp of alarm and fright in the crowd. I heard Livy yell, a sound like a cry and a nightmare. I looked at Dewey and her mother. Dewey's eyes were wide, her mouth open. There was a blue vein forking up her white brow. The chain cranked loud and startled me. It kept lifting and the animal's hind legs trailed awfully through the pile of feces. When he cleared the ground, he began to turn in the air, a slow rotation, the chain so tight into the flesh of the neck that I thought it might separate the head from the tremendous weight of the body. We watched the body rotating slowly, inanimate and limp, but the elephant was still breathing. A veterinarian holding a handkerchief over his nose put a stethoscope against the great side of the animal, then looked at the others and shrugged, and they all stood back and waited a while, trying not to breathe the effluvium of what had come from the body. Twice the process was repeated at intervals of several minutes. Each time there was another shrug, another wait. Finally, the vet nodded with his instrument, and the chain was slowly loosened, the hind legs and quarters settling into the mess, weirdly out of kilter the two front legs bending outward at a ridiculous and terrifying angle. They stopped the chain and men began to disperse the crowd. The release of the elephant's fluids had apparently not occurred to anyone as a hazard. But it seems so now. The crowd was ushered out of the vicinity and soon Father and Livy and I were walking along Market Street toward home. Dewey and her mother were a few paces ahead of us. It looked like Dewey was helping her mother along. Livy cried softly and father assured her that the elephant hadn't suffered, but we had seen the suffering and we were not calmed by his words. I was carrying in my mind the image of Anna Scott's crying face and the blood on Thaddeus Marcus Adams' torn white shirt. But there was the elephant too, the stupendous outsized spectacle of its dying. I thought the world a terrible place and I thought I had learned this in the space of that one day. I looked at the fading light in the sky and felt my equilibrium shift and go off. It was as if the fever had come back. As I had the thought, Livy spoke it. I feel feverish again, she said. Father touched her forehead. You don't feel warm. We came to Mrs. Lessing's house and there was a light in the window, though it wasn't quite dusk yet. Mother was on her por our porch. She walked out to meet us. Mrs. Lessing came out too. Dewey and her mother were already in their own house, shutting curtains. I've had to fire my maid, Mrs. Lessing said. I'm afraid she was part of that business up the street. The elephant, Mother said. We'll talk later, said Father. Good night, Mrs. Lessing. The animal is dead then? Father nodded. It didn't go off as smoothly as they'd thought. We never should have gone down there to see it. I wish we'd stayed home, Livy said. She sniffled and wiped her nose. We crossed the lawn to our house. I looked back toward the rail yard. The first stars were twinkling above it. What was she talking about, Mother? Asked Father as we went inside. What business up the street? Some black opened his mouth when he shouldn't have and paid the price for it. It was Father, many years later, who told me what they did do. I'm sorry, it was Father, many years later, who told me what they did to Thaddeus Adams. I had to jog his memory by explaining that it happened the day they hanged the elephant. He described it all, though he wasn't there to see it. In his estimations of things, it was unfortunate but necessary. He worked hard to teach me honor, the love of one's family, the value of self-sacrifice, kindness and concern, graciousness and thrift, industriousness and hard work, the love of country. I never knew or found out what else might have happened or how Thaddeus fared in his harmed life. And I never saw Anna Scott again, nor ever heard what became of her. Dewey moved away before I reached majority. One fall morning, her house was empty and new people moved in a week later. My parents lived to great age, into the early hundreds. We buried Livy in the spring of 1958 after an automobile accident, but she was 67. Mother and father were still, were still very healthy, even strong. Livy's family took good care of him that day. Livy had raised three handsome and successful boys. They spoke with my father and me about all the trouble the coloreds, as they were then called, were causing. I went along with their talk, fearing the disapproval I might have to face if I said anything, and I confess agreeing with some of what was said. But then I remembered Anna Scott talking to me in fever in the year 1903. I've 
grown so old. Everybody's gone now. Sometimes lately, I dream that I'm in that railroad yard and I can't see for the blinding hot light. The elephant is dangling from the chain under the fretwork of the derrick. The iron supporting bars make a skinny black shadow in the red sky. I'm turning to look behind me. Something awful is there, but I can't see it. Something weighs me down so heavily that my movements are terrifyingly slow. I move, but nothing seems to change. I'm a statue. Utter stillness, trying to turn, trying to open my eyes in the blindness, and I never do see what waits in that dream that is so threatening. Other men, a man, something not human. I never know in the dream. But I think I know after I wake up. I think I know. And I try to gather the practical matters of my present life to myself, like a protective cloak, the schedule here, the time, the coming morning. The trail can happen miles and years away. It can go on happening down in the heart, in the dark. So these mornings are slow. And sometimes it seems the light won't come at all. And I lie here remembering that day so far past when Anna Scott, crying, looked at me that way and called me white boy. And later I stood in a crowd that had gathered to watch the death of the beast.